Starting off this countdown, we have Elizabeth Wetlofer. This is, I've done this and I'm ready to face it, but I would love to go. Elizabeth Wetlofer was a Canadian registered nurse for nine years in southwestern Ontario. In 2016, she quit her nursing job, checked herself into a psychiatric hospital, and confessed to her crimes. Apparently, between 2007 to 2016, she used her powers as a nurse to take the lives of eight of her patients and injured six others. She would do so by giving them lethal doses of insulin. She also admitted to stealing opioids to fuel her personal addiction. After she confessed to the killings, an interview took place with the police. Police, and that's when she confessed her crimes once again, this time in a detailed statement. Apparently, she had voices in her head telling her to kill those patients. Part of me had started to believe that it was the devil, and part of me thought it might be God. At first, she believed that this was God talking to her, so she felt okay killing for him. Then later on, she thought maybe it was the devil. On top of that, she claimed that it was a gut instinct telling her that these people needed to be killed. And once she did the deed, she would hear laughter in her chest. Whatever it was, it wasn't a voice in my head, it was a voice in here. And when I would do it afterwards, I would hear like a laughter in my head. She was sentenced to eight concurrent life sentences with no chance of parole for 25 years. In our ninth spot, we have Robert Durst. Robert Durst is an American convicted murderer and possible serial killer. It all started in 1982 with the disappearance of his wife, Kathy Durst. Obviously, he was the main suspect. Then in 2000, he murdered one of his friends, Susan Berman, and in 2001, he killed his neighbor. And just this year, he was finally convicted for killing his wife. During his interviews and interrogations, he maintained his innocence, claiming that he never did it. But after one of his final interviews, he made a grave mistake. He went to the bathroom and didn't realize that his mic was still on. While in the bathroom, he was talking to himself and basically confessed to the killings. There it is. You're caught. The interviewers were completely shocked by what they heard, and Robert was immediately arrested. In our 8th spot, we have Daniel Wozniak. Daniel Wozniak is a former community theater actor who in May of 2010 took the lives of two people. During that time, he was struggling financially. He was in debt and unemployed. Then when he heard that his friend Sam Hur had $62,000 from combat pay, he decided to kill Sam in order to steal his money. Then he ended up killing a woman named Julie Kabushi, a 23-year-old college student who was tutoring Sam. His plan was to make it seem like Sam killed Julie and then went on the run. But in the end, he was caught. This video is from the police interrogation of Daniel. Here's him putting the blame on Sam. I opened the door, it was Sam. Right. I'm like, hey man, what's going on? Everything good? And he's like, not good, we're in trouble. We need to get the out of here. And so he drove, he's like, there's a dead body in my apartment. He said he had been doing some heavy drugs. He's like, I shot somebody. I was not happy about it. It was a fit of rage. And honestly, she had it coming. I said she. But of course, the police weren't buying his story. It was all too convenient. Where's the gun, Sam? What did you do with the gun? I'm not Sam. My name's Dan. I know, but that's what you heard. Wasn't that what you were asking him? No, I have nothing to do with this because my life was in danger with my wife. I'm sorry. How was your life in danger? He threatened it. The two interrogators could see through Daniel's act. In fact, they said it was as if he was putting on a theater show for them. In the end, Daniel did confess, but figured he might try and act insane in order to get off with lesser charges. Money and insanity. Money and insanity. Okay. <laughs> In our seventh spot, we have patient number 18. Now, this has got to be one of the creepiest and mysterious clips on the internet. It's an interview featuring a man named patient 18. This interview is filmed at a psychiatric hospital, and this man is there because he has schizophrenia. This tape is actually what schools use to teach their students about schizophrenia and the mind. But it's mysterious because we don't know much about this dude. Now, I just want to say, having schizophrenia or mental health issues does not make this guy an evil person. He's on today's list because apparently at the hospital he admitted to taking someone's life. Plus, he has a history of criminal behavior. Upon doing more research, this might be a man named Stephen E. Anyways, take a look at this interview. And what happened that ended up with your being here in the hospital? The psychiatrist decided 
that this was the situation for me. Did he tell you why? No, the psychiatrist did not. Has anybody told you why? No. I got chills. I don't know about you. It's quite interesting how he carefully plans out his answers. Plus, no matter what they're talking about, he still shows no emotion. And in what way are you different? I am trying to do with my life something which few people try to do. And this influences my thinking and consequently my actions. He may seem calm on the outside, but what you can't imagine is everything that's going on in his head. You can tell he's trying hard to stay in control. As soon as I express the belief that I do not belong in this hospital, which is a mental hospital, then those who dislike me want to find a worse place for me. In our sixth spot, we have Alonzo Perez. In 2016, Alonzo Perez was charged for a series of crimes, including robbery with use of a deadly weapon, attempted murder with use of a deadly weapon, grand larceny, and battery. He was also arrested in connection with the death of Mohammed Robinson. This is footage of Alonzo inside of the interrogation cell waiting to be questioned. But not much of that actually happens as he manages to escape. First, we see him looking around at the cameras, and then he decides to forcibly remove his handcuffs. Now he does manage to get them off, but he's not ready to leave yet. He hasn't thought of a plan. So he pretends that his handcuffs are still on and he thinks of an escape plan. When he thinks of his plan, he gets up, climbs up, and escapes by crawling through the ceiling. He then drove away in a rental truck that someone left with the engine running. But don't worry, it was short lived freedom because within days he was caught again and in more trouble. In the end though, he did plead guilty to three murders. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Andre Chikatilo. Andre Chikatilo otherwise known as the Butcher of Rostov or the Rostov Ripper, was responsible for the deaths of 56 individuals. He would lure people that he met at bus stops or train stations away to remote locations and then he would murder them. Sometimes he would even eat certain parts of his victims. In this interview, what shocks a lot of people is the fact that everyone expects him to act like a monster. But in fact, he acts quite the opposite. He seems innocent, which is either an act or, you know, his true personality. So he keeps up the innocent act saying how he feels sorry, blah blah blah. But the act drops when he is asked one question. Now the interview is in Russian, but I have the translation. So the interviewer asks him if he has ever thought about meeting his victims in heaven or hell. He answers with, and I quote, No, I have never thought about that. Never. I feel like it doesn't bother me. I have never thought about it. I have already passed all rounds of hell in my life. I am already ready to pass away to the other their world again. That right there is creepy, not gonna lie. In our fourth spot, we have David Berkowitz. But you probably better know him as the son of Sam. He was a serial killer who took the lives of six individuals and wounded seven others in New York City for more than a year. He would typically target good looking young women with long brown hair. As a result, a number of women were cutting their hair short or dyeing it blonde. He was eventually known as the son of Sam because he would leave letters near his victims' bodies, signing it off with that name. In the end, he was caught and claimed that his neighbor's dog was possessed by a demon and that this demon dog was the one telling him to kill these people. Wild, I know. Well, years later, he did this interview. He admits to being into Satanism and how it influenced him. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about Satan, uh, what are you actually referring to? Well, um, you know, many people may uh, not really understand that, but at, at there was a time I was so confused and, and so troubled that um, I, I was seeking meaning and purpose. I was seeking... Uh, something I, I don't know my as my life began to spin out of control I mean I got involved in like Satanism and I was reading the Satanic Bible and he continues on talking about himself but a lot of people believe he was just putting on an act the whole time that he was trying to convince people that he's normal so that he would be released early this is pretty common among serial killers they love to manipulate people but how does it feel to be here for, for 30 years knowing that this is gonna be it uh, you know, 
it's like you know the expression take one day at a time and uh, it's never easy you know being incarcerated uh, I have no one to blame but myself in our third spot we have Michael Beaver in July of 2015 16 year old Michael Beaver and his 18 year old brother Robert took the lives of their parents and three siblings they first attacked their sister when she screamed their mother ran out of the bedroom and they stabbed her over 50 times eventually they worked their way around the house killing their family members it's a very scary and graphic case in this interview Michael completely confesses to everything to an officer so he was buying weapons because you guys had talked about murdering. Yeah, but maybe he started planning again. Okay. And that you didn't want to do it? I didn't, I don't want to do it. I didn't, um, just because I didn't kill anyone. Okay. I uh, stabbed someone. Who did you stab? Um, my younger brother, Christopher. Christopher? How old is Christopher? Um, nine, I think. What did you stab him with? Um, my knife. What's your knife look like? There's literally no emotion in his voice. And for being so young, he doesn't seem affected by this at all. But here's the thing, this guy was obsessed with other killers, and the police officer noticed this and kept prying. Because um, you mentioned a couple names of, are those like serial killers or something? What, like Columbine? Yeah. Uh, Columbine and James Egan Holmes. James Egan Holmes is a guy that shot at the theater. In Colorado? Yeah, he killed 12 and uh, Wow. How many were killed in Columbine? Columbine? I don't know. Like, 15, okay. I think. He knew the killer's first and last names in their kill count. No one just knows that information off the top of their head, so that's creepy. In our second spot, we have the BTK killer. Between the years of 1974 to 1991, American serial killer Dennis Ratter took the lives of 10 individuals. In 2005, he was convicted for his crimes and was sentenced to 175 years in solitary confinement without the possibility of parole. This video is Dennis's confession to killing Maureen Hedge. So I very carefully snuck into the house, kind of like a cat burglar, and after checking the house, she wasn't there. So about that time, the doors rattled, so I went, went back to one of the bedrooms and hid back there in one of the bedrooms. He then proceeded to talk about how he stayed in her house for hours until the next morning when he woke up and strangled her. Well, I manually strangled her when she started to scream. So you but, used your hands? Yes, sir. And you strangled her? Did she die? Yes. It's chilling seeing him talk so casually about all of this. And in our number one spot today, we have Isi Sagawa. If you haven't heard of this case, then whoo, brace yourself because it's a very dark and gruesome one. In 1981, Isi Sagawa killed and ate a woman named Renee Hartfelt. Apparently, he always had a fantasy to eat a beautiful human. When he saw Renee, he knew she was the one. On June 11th, 1981, he invited her over, and then he shot her at the back of the neck and then ate her over the next two days. That's not even the worst part. The worst part is that he was never convicted of his crimes. He literally spent two days in jail, then was sent back to Japan, and then he became a celebrity there. He was so famous that he made a living through the public's interest in his crime. Imagine that, literally becoming wealthy for killing someone. Someone. He's guilty, he's even admitted to it, but he never got penalized. Here are some disturbing moments from an interview with him. He continues on going into gruesome details about his murder and about another time that he attacked a different woman. I personally had a hard time sitting still watching this. It's just way too much. Moving on to number nine, we have Alan Leger. Alan Leger is a Canadian serial killer who on June 21st of 1986 entered a convenience store in Black River Bridge, New Brunswick with two other accomplices and robbed the joint. While doing so, they beat the store owner to death, but they were later caught and arrested. He was given a life sentence and sent to prison. However, in 1989, he managed to escape and was on the run for seven months. During this time, he killed four more innocent people. He also committed arson and a list of other crimes as well. Eventually, he was recaptured and is now spending the rest of his life in Canada's Maximum Security Special Handling Unit. Moving on to number eight, we have Rodney Halbauer. Ever since Rodney was young, he has been committing crimes. It started when he was only 16 years old. During his younger years, he was arrested and released on parole a number of times. But when released, he would commit 
more crimes, like theft. In 1975, Rodney was released on bail after taking advantage of a Las Vegas blackjack dealer. But while on bail, he took advantage of and killed six other women and received a life sentence. However, in 1977, he actually escaped jail and kidnapped his own daughter. Shortly after, he was recaptured only to escape again in 1986. While on the run, he stabbed and injured another woman. Thankfully, once again, he was recaptured. Wouldn't you think after the first time they would keep a closer eye on him? I guess not. In our seventh spot, we have Thomas Silverstein. Now, this dude is said to be one of the most dangerous prisoners of all time and the most violent prisoner in America. He was first jailed in 1978 for armed robbery. While in jail, he killed a prison officer and two inmates. He also was the leader for the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang for quite some time. This prison gang is the largest and deadliest prison gang in the US, with an estimated 20,000 members inside the prison and on the streets. Because of how many people he killed and injured in prison, Silverstein got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There, he was confined in a six by seven foot cell. He was under 24 hour surveillance. In fact, the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always watch him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. In our sixth spot today, we have Victor Figueroa. On February 6, 1997, Victor Figueroa managed to escape Moroa Shock Incarceration Facility in Mineville, New York. Victor had been serving a one to four year sentence for drug possession, but decided to take his chances and flee. When authorities noticed that he was missing, they searched the area, but all the leads ran cold. He has not been seen or heard from since. In fact, he's the only New York State prison inmate to escape and never be found. Either he's still out there or he died while trying to escape. Either way, it's a bit scary thinking that he could potentially still be out there. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with James Eddie Diggs. To the public, James Eddie Diggs seemed like a top-notch citizen. He seemed to be a great family man with a happy wife and two young sons. However, in the morning of May 26, 1949, he shot and killed his wife and kids before disappearing forever. Police did manage to find him a week later, but he managed to escape the officer by shooting him in the face and killing him. He since fled into the woods and hasn't been caught since. In fact, he was one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives for the longest time, but he was eventually removed from the list in 1961 and is said to be dead by now. In our fourth spot, we have Robert Mon Maudsley. Robert Maudsley is considered Britain's most dangerous prisoner, and you're about to find out why! In 1974, Maudsley was arrested for taking advantage of young individuals. But during his trial, he was found unfit and was sent to Broadmoor Hospital instead of a prison. While there, Maudsley and another patient locked themselves in a cell with another patient and held him hostage. While there, they tortured him to death over a period of nine hours. After this incident, he was convicted of manslaughter and was sent to Wakefield Prison. And there, he killed three inmates, after which he got placed in solitary confinement and spends his life in a glass cell underneath Wakefield Jail. In our third spot, we have George Edward Wright. In 1962, George Edward Wright was convicted for murder and was sentenced to up to 30 years in prison. Wright and three other men went on a spree of armed robbery, one in which they shot a man and took off with his money, which was only $70, so was it really worth it? Anyways, they were caught and put into jail. But then in 1970, Wright managed to escape from a prison in New Jersey. He was caught and locked up once again, only to escape once more in 1972. This time, he made sure he was never going to be caught again. So he came up with a plan. This plan involved hijacking a Delta Airlines flight and collecting ransom for the release of the passengers. Upon doing so, they flew the plane to Portugal. In 2011, the police caught up with him in Portugal, but since Portugal has no extradition treaty with the United States, Wright was released remains a fugitive to this day. Coming in at number two, we have Eric Rudolph. In 1996, Eric Rudolph bombed Atlanta's Centennial Olympic Park during the Summer Games. As a result, two individuals were killed and over 100 were injured. But that was just the beginning of his deadly bombing spree. He pulled off three more bombings, injuring hundreds more. For five years, the police were on a hunt for Eric. At one point, he was one of the top 10 fugitives on the FBI's list. It wasn't until 2003 that Eric got arrested. Turns out that he was hiding in the mountains for five years. Being a skilled outdoorsman, this helped him greatly. When he was caught, he pled guilty to all four bombings and was given four life sentences without the possibility of parole. He's now spending the rest of his life in the super prison in Florence, Colorado. And in our number one spot today, we have Santiago Maduros. In 2010, Santiago fired into a random person's car 
because one of the passengers was wearing the wrong color jacket. The victim had no ties to any gang. He was just an innocent person riding in his sister's car. He was severely injured and his sister was unfortunately killed. A couple weeks later, Santiago and some of his friends were robbing a car. And when a group of men tried to stop them, he shot at them as well. He killed a random person that was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. From there, he was on the run for about a decade. Starting off this countdown, we have the Hitchhiker's Killer. The Hitchhiker's Killer is the name given to serial killer Donald Henry Gaskins. He started his killings in 1969, where he would pick up hitchhikers to later kill them. It's believed that he killed more than a dozen people. But even before he went on this killing spree, Gaskins had a history of sick crimes. Finally, on November 14th of 1975, Gaskins was arrested after a man witnessed him killing two men and called the police. He was later sentenced to death, but this sentence turned into life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. However, his killings did not stop while behind bars. While in prison, he became the only man to have ever killed an inmate on death row. In our ninth spot today, we have Glenn Stark Chambers. In January of 1975, Glenn Stark Chambers got into a heated dispute with his girlfriend, Connie Weeks. It ended with him taking her life. As a result, he was sentenced to death by electric chair, later reduced to life imprisonment. However, Glenn escaped prison on July 13th. Glenn, with two other inmates, ganged up to attack their detention officer and then escaped through a window. Now, he was captured three days later, but only to escape several years later. So he worked with the prison to help build furniture. He came up with a good idea to put himself into one of the boxes and have himself carried out of prison in a transport truck, and it worked. Even after three decades, Glenn has never been found. If he was still alive today, he would be in his 70s, so he could still be out there somewhere. In our eighth spot, we have Ted Bundy. Now, what was so scary about Ted Bundy is how smart he was. He was the definition of evil genius. So basically, he would use his smarts to manipulate women and then kill them. Bundy is said to be responsible for murdering 30 women, although it's thought that his number is much higher. Now, Bundy was actually able to escape custody multiple times. The first time, he jumped out of a second story building and fled while at the courthouse. He had planned this for days, practicing jumping from his top bed bunk in prison down to the floor to strengthen his ankles. Now, eventually he was caught, but then a while later, he escaped again. This time, he forced himself to lose weight in order to squeeze through a hole in his cell ceiling. When he did escape the second time, he went on to murder more women, until being caught once again. In our seventh spot, we have Charles Manson. Infamous cult leader Charles Manson, who led the Manson family cult, had his followers commit crimes and murders on his behalf. Some of his members committed a series of nine murders in July and August of 1969. In 1971, Manson was convicted of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for the deaths of seven people, including film actress Sharon Tate. What's scary about Manson is that he was also an evil genius. If you've ever seen his interviews, he acts quite wild and strange. People think that he's out of his mind. At one point, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and paranoid delusion disorder. But some people think that he was just too smart for his own good and he was just faking all of this. In 1971, Manson received the death sentence, but a year later, the government got rid of capital punishment, so his sentence was changed to life in prison instead. In our sixth spot, we have Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Between 1963 and 1965, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley worked together to torture, take advantage of, and kill a number of young individuals. What they did was incredibly messed up and it'll make your stomach churn. Now, these two were actually given the name the Moors Murderers because after taking the lives of their victims, they would bury their bodies on the Moors outside of Manchester. Both individuals were sentenced to life in prison for their crimes. Ian was actually placed in solitary confinement, whereas Myra died in prison in 2002. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Lester Eubanks. In 1965, Lester was convicted of taking the life of Mary Ellen Diener. As a result, he was given the death penalty, which later got changed to a life sentence. Now, over the years in prison, apparently Lester changed his ways and became very well behaved. In fact, on December 7th, 1973, they let him go out to Christmas shop for his family. While out in a mall, he managed to escape his guards and flee. To this day, he still hasn't been caught. He's out there somewhere in hiding. 
who knows where he fled to or what he's up to now. Coming in at number four, we have Robert William Fisher. Now, this guy is one of the FBI's most wanted fugitives. He is on the run after a triple homicide and arson. On April 9th, 2001, Fisher took the lives of his wife and two children before blowing up their house. It is still unclear as to why he did this, and he's been on the run ever since. And please have no leads. On April 20th, his car was found in a forest near Payson, Arizona, but Robert was nowhere to be found. On November 3rd, 2021, Fisher was removed from the FBI's most wanted fugitives list. But despite them doing this, he still remains a very wanted fugitive. In our third spot, we have Bradford Bishop. Bradford Bishop Jr. is a former United States Foreign Service officer who is now a wanted fugitive. On March 1st of 1976, Bishop started to spiral after not receiving the promotion he really wanted. He then left his work early, drove to the bank, withdrew money, and then bought a sledgehammer, gas can, shovel, and pitchfork. He then returned home where he killed his wife, mother, and three sons. He then drove the body several miles away way before burying them in a wooded swamp area before setting them on fire. As a result, he was placed on the FBI's list of 10 most wanted fugitives. They have no clue as to where Bishop is now. He could be anywhere, but they do believe that he fled to Europe. Moving on to number two, we have Arthur Hutchinson. Arthur Hutchinson has lived a life of crime for murder, attempted murder, theft, and burglary. In fact, he spent five years in prison for the attempted murder of his half-brother. In September of 1983, he was brought into a police station after being arrested for theft. While there, he asked to go to the bathroom and then proceeded to jump out of the bathroom window and fled. He was on the run for three and a half weeks. While on the run, he crashed a wedding and murdered the bride's father father, mother, and brother. Later that day, he broke into another person's home and stabbed all three of the residents to death. He was finally caught on November 5th of 1983 and sentenced to life imprisonment. And in our number one spot today, we have Ahmed Siraji. From 1986 to 1997, Ahmed took the lives of 42 females. The bodies of his victims were found in a sugarcane field. What he would do was after killing them, he would bury them waist deep in his field with their heads facing his house. He believed that by doing so, so this gave him great power, but he was later caught and arrested alongside his sisters and three wives who helped him. One of his wives was actually sentenced to death, but that was later changed to life imprisonment. Ahmed, on the other hand, was sentenced to death by a firing squad in 2008. Starting off this countdown, we have Donald Harvey, aka the Angel of Death. Donald Harvey is a nurse turned serial killer. So he was working in a hospital as a nurse and was secretly killing off his patients. To him, he was doing them a favor. He thought that his chronically ill patients needed a relief from the pain. So he would smother them with pillows or would poison them or let their oxygen tanks run out. It's believed that he took the lives of over 70 people. However, in 1987, he was only convicted for 37 counts of murder. He was sentenced to life plus 20 years. In March of 2017, Harvey was beat up badly by a fellow inmate. He passed away shortly after. In our ninth spot, we have Albert DeSalvo. Albert DeSalvo, better known as the Boston Strangler, took the lives of 13 women between 1962 and 1964. He would strangle these women with a piece of their clothing before taking advantage of them. In January of 1967, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. A month later, him and two other inmates actually managed to escape from prison, and a full-scale manhunt ensued. Thankfully, it wasn't long until he was recaptured. However, in 1973, Albert was stabbed to death by another prisoner. In our eighth spot, we have Ronnie McPeters. Now, Ronnie McPeters has actually been deemed too insane to execute. So Ronnie was first arrested after taking the life of a 27 year old woman. The woman, Linda Marie Baltazar, was running errands when Ronnie came up to her window while panhandling. She shooed him away and he left, but he ended up coming back and shooting her. He was first placed in jail for his crime and then placed in the rubber room. But that didn't stop him because he was known to set fires in the jail and harass other inmates. So they moved him to San Quentin prison where he was awaiting death row. And that's when he started acting even crazier. Apparently he would attack other prisoners and guards and was known to smear his feces all over his cell and even himself. This behavior got him off of death row. They literally thought that he was far too troubled to be executed. 
In our seventh spot, we have Mark Chopper Reed. Mark Reed is an Australian criminal who lived a life of crime. He was known to rip off drug dealers as well as he would kidnap and torture members of the criminal underworld. It's believed that he was responsible for the death of 19 people and the attempted murder of 11 others. In fact, the movie Chopper is based off of his life and it's a wild movie. The things he would do were insane. For example, he had a fellow inmate cut both of his ears off so that he could leave H Division and be transferred to a different wing. He also once played Russian roulette with himself. Who does that for fun? In our sixth spot today, we have Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most famous serial killers in the world. People all around the world know of him and the sadistic and disturbing crimes that he committed. From 1978 to 1991, Jeffrey murdered and dismembered 17 male individuals. What he did afterwards was even more disturbing. He would keep some of the body parts as souvenirs, even take photographs of the deceased. When police searched his home, they found it littered with human remains. Dahmer was finally arrested on July 22nd of 1991. However, while in prison, there were multiple attempts on his life. On November 28th, 1994, an inmate, Christopher Scarver, finally succeeded at taking Dahmer's life. His reasoning behind this? Well, apparently Dahmer was known to taunt others in prison. He would do this by making his prison food look like severed limbs to taunt the other people. He would even drizzle ketchup on top of his blood. Christopher and others found this very unnerving, so he decided to take action against him and beat him to death. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Jason Barnum, aka better known as Eyeball Man. And that's because he literally has a tattoo on his eyeball, like he tattooed it completely black. If that doesn't speak volumes about who he is, then I don't know what does. He also has one side of his face tattooed to look like a skull. So not only does this dude look like a scary prisoner, but he is one. This dude has a long list of crimes under his belt, including possession of heroin, first degree attempted murder, first degree burglary, and third degree felony and possession of a weapon. In fact, he was sentenced to 22 years in jail after shooting a police officer. Moving on to number four, we have Nico Jenkins. This guy is one of the scariest inmates in the world. Some say he's the craziest inmate in the world, and you're about to find out why. One time, he killed a man just because he stared at him the wrong way. Not only that, but in court, Jenkins was known to speak in some weird language. He said he used this language to communicate with an Egyptian serpent god. And this god was the one giving him orders to kill people. He also enjoyed talking about the people he killed and smiled the whole time while doing so. In the end, he was convicted for killing four individuals. Moving on to number three, we have Damien Folks. In 2002, Damien Folks was sentenced to 12 years for a series of armed robberies that he had committed. But while in jail, he committed even more crimes. In 2010, he attempted to kill another prison inmate. He made a DIY shank by melting a razor blade onto plastic cutlery, and he used it to slice a guy's throat. As a result, he was transferred to a higher security prison but that did not stop him. A year later, he killed an inmate by strangling him to death with strips of his bedding. These attacks gained him the title of being an extremely dangerous prisoner. In our second spot today, we have Alexander Pikushkin. Alexander is a Russian serial killer who wanted to complete the number of squares on a chessboard by killing 64 people. It's said that he has killed around at least 49 individuals and possibly as many as 60. In fact, he was inspired by another serial killer, Andre Chikatilo, who I have talked about before. In his mind, he wanted to compete with him and kill even more individuals than Andre did. Now, what I find the weirdest is when Alexander was young, he was said to be such a kind and sociable child. That was until one day when he got struck in the head by a swing. From then on, his whole demeanor completely changed and he got really aggressive. So they think that this accident turned him into a serial killer. And in our number one spot today, we have Pedro Rodriguez Filho, AKA the Brazilian maniac. This guy is a Brazilian serial killer who claims to have taken the lives of 100 individuals. He started killing at a young age, one of the first kills being his father. He apparently killed his father with a machete, cut out his heart, and then chewed on it. He also has been known to kill and torture a number of gang members. 
He did this all before he was 18. He was arrested on May 24th of 1973, during which he was placed in a car with another criminal who he killed for no reason. And while in prison, he went on to kill more people. It's said that he took the lives of 47 inmates in jail alone. Pedro served 42 years in prison before his release in 2018. Yes, he killed that many people and then he got released. Starting off this countdown, we have Gary Ridgway. Gary Ridgway, otherwise known as the Green River Killer, took the lives of 48 women between 1980 to 1990. But it's believed that his number may be as high as 71 people. He gets his name due to the fact that he would dump the bodies along riverbanks in South King County. In 2001, he was arrested. After his conviction, he did an interview where he talked all about his murders and how he had the desire to kill ever since he was little. But I took my aggression on, I couldn't take it on my mom, I had to take it on my animals. and. As stated in the interview, he confessed that he started killing at a young age. He had this built up anger towards his mom, but he couldn't harm her, so he would harm animals instead. Living things? Living things, killing, killing animals. Okay. Killing animals. Um. In this interview, he went on to talk more about his victims in detail. Hearing someone confess to murder is just very, very disturbing. In our ninth spot, we have John Hughes. But before I go any further, make sure to hit that thumbs up button because it really helps us out. I don't think like normal people, never have. I have racing thoughts, it's been that way since I was a kid. I'm constantly, it doesn't matter if I'm asleep, if I'm awake, I'm constantly thinking of a hundred things at one time. John Hughes considers himself the Antichrist. He was arrested back in 2008 after killing a trucker at a rest stop along Interstate 29. This dude is intense and incredibly scary. He claims to have killed 15 to 20 people, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. Either way, in this interview for KMBC News, Lara Moretz gets the chance to interview him. And he talks about the people he has taken the lives of and why he did this. Rest area, and that was a way for me to gain control, to, to show, I don't know, I guess I would assert my dominance, I guess you could say. That'd be the way to put it. And it shut everybody up for a while. The scariest part of the interview is when Lara asks if he feels bad about killing people. And this was his response. I don't feel bad about killing uh, anyone. Not personally, that I've personally done myself, no. I just view things as objects, people, animals, the trees, cars, they're just all the same to me. So no, he feels no remorse. In our eighth spot, we have Jose Martinez. Explanation because I want to get them. I didn't want the cops to find them. I want to find them myself. We went to this little house. We broke in there and we find one, I shot him. This dude is one you never want to mess with. And he reveals why during his interview. Basically, Jose was a hitman for a drug cartel. He admitted to killing three dozen people as a hitman and dozens of others just on his own, many of whom were people that just pissed him off. For example, in this interview, he talks about one of his brother-in-law's friends. Whenever the friend would visit, he would tell him to park on the side of the road, not on his driveway. He told him this a number of times, yet he still continued to park on the driveway. So what did he do? He asked the guy to take him for a ride in his truck. He then shot him, just to teach him a lesson. I told him, didn't I told you not to park in my driveway? And he said he didn't listen to nobody except his mother. Okay. okay. Moving on to number six, we have Otis Toole. Otis Toole, or the Jacksonville Cannibal, is a serial killer convicted of six counts of murder. He's most famous for killing the son of American's most wanted host, John Walsh. In an interview from 1993, we see how dark and twisted Toole really is. He would talk about his dark desires, like watching an entire city burn. He then went on to justify his killings, saying that taking someone's life is no different than stepping on a bug or eating animal meat. There's way more disturbing stuff that he discusses, but it's just too much to talk about on YouTube. Like he goes into depth about his killings. It's way too much to hear. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Joel Rifkin. Tragedy happens in lives. Unfortunately, it was their lives. Certain instances 
the world wouldn't know his name until after his killing spree had ended. Now, in a rare prison interview, serial killer Joel Rifkin talks about his sickening crimes down to the smallest detail. Joel Rifkin was an American serial killer responsible for taking the lives of 17 women in the 1990s. He was caught in 1993 when cops pulled him over for a missing license plate. But to their horrors, they found his latest victim in his trunk. He was then sentenced to 203 years in prison. In this interview, Joel just seems so proud of himself when he's recalling his crimes. He also talks about the police's interrogation process and why he confessed to the crimes. The most disturbing thing though is when he admits to keeping trophies from each of his victims. He said he did this so that he could remember each victim and what he did to them. As the numbers started to increase, an ID would, you know, okay, that has a photo, I know, I know who that girl was, uh, or a piece of jewelry, okay, I know that it's from that girl. In our fourth spot, we have Israel Keys. Israel Keys started his killings in 1996 and continued on until March of 2012 when he was finally arrested. He was known for traveling to a number of locations to commit his crimes. Then he would rob banks and homes so that he could afford to travel to kill. In this interview, we see him talk about his killings and how he selected his victims. When I was smart, I would let them come to me. Just remote area. People just found it gross how calmly he talks about this all while eating a bagel and drinking. He continued on saying what his strategy was, and that was to grab people in remote locations like parks and campgrounds, even cemeteries. You might not get exactly what you're, there's not as much to choose from in a manner of speaking, but there's also no witnesses really, there's nobody else around. In our third spot, we have Chris Watts. If you've seen the Netflix documentary on Chris Watts and his family, then you know how messed up this whole story is. Chris is guilty of killing his wife and their two daughters. When he was brought into questioning, he denied having anything to do with this. But after failing the polygraph test, the police started nailing him hard. That's when he came up with this elaborate lie about what happened. Okay. It's crazy seeing him put on this whole show and turning his wife into a criminal, saying she was the one that hurt their daughters and then he hurt her as a result. She hurt them. In the end, the officers saw right through his fabricated story. But still, it's crazy. Moving on to number two, we have Richard Kuklinski. I could get over on you, I'll get you to do what I wanted you to do, is to hurt your family. Richard started killing at a very young age. He committed his first murder when he was just 13 years old. Over the span of his career, he took the lives of around 200 people. Could even be more. I mean, he would often kill homeless people just for fun. On top of that, he worked as a hitman for the mafia. So yeah, his count is pretty high. It was revealed that any person who was ever deemed his friend was eventually killed off by him. In 1988, he was caught by an undercover cop and sent to prison. In this interview, it is truly disturbing to see the lack of remorse he has. Listen to him talk about him shooting a guy. And I went pop, pop, pop. And I went pop, pop. And I can see the material moving on his, uh, on his jacket as these things. Actually, they made little marks on it. They, on the jacket, I guess they were burn marks. I think the scariest part was all of a sudden during the interview, he gets this messed up smile on his face and just stares at the interviewer for an uncomfortable amount of time. I legit got uncomfortable for the interviewer. And then after that long, unbearable pause, he starts asking the interviewer questions. Hmm. <laughs> What do you think? 
about me. Anything good, bad, or indifferent? It just made me cringe. It's so bad. And in our number one spot, we have Zachary Davis. This interview gave me the chills. It makes me so uncomfortable. So this is the interview of Zachary Davis. In August of 2012, he took his mother's life before trying to set his house on fire with his brother inside. Now, Zachary has been diagnosed with a number of mental illnesses, including schizophrenia and depressive disorder. In 2007, when he was nine years old, his father passed away from ALS, and that apparently started this all. He just spiraled out of control and became withdrawn. He even had an app on his phone about serial killers, and in his notebooks, he would write about disturbing things, like you can't can't spell slaughter without laughter. The creepiest part of this interview is when Dr. Phil asks him about the murder weapon, which was a sledgehammer. At one point while discussing it, he literally smiles as if he's proud of what he did. That sent shivers down my spine. It is terrifying. Number 10, Tomas de Torquemada. Ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? Well, this guy was one of its star killers. Not only do we wish it never happened in the first place, it did, so we might as well talk about it and learn from it. But we can't discuss the Inquisition without mentioning Tomas, who was responsible for thousands of deaths. He gave people two choices, either join the Catholic Church or die, which led to thousands of Jewish and Islamic people being exiled from Spain. He played the role of inquisitor and was in charge of investigating and punishing heretics. He oversaw the burning of thousands of innocent people, as Tomas often used cruel methods of extracting confessions from people he believed to be heretics. He seemed to almost enjoy his job hanging, burning, suffocating, and tormenting people with the rack and waterboarding. No one knows exactly how many people died during the Inquisition, but historians estimate anywhere between 30,000 to 300,000. Pretty, pretty wide gap there. Number nine, Caligula. Man, his name is too fun to say. Too bad he wasn't a fun guy. It's better I tell you now that essentially this list is a depiction of what happens when the wrong people get their hands on power. From 37 AD to 41 AD, Caligula ruled as if he was some kind of mad god that needed to be satisfied. Not only did his addiction to gambling cause a nightmare for the economy, he seemed to delight in suffering. In the first three months of his rule, he made his people sacrifice 160,000 animals in his name. When he first took over as ruler, people actually liked him though. He made helpful political reforms and recalled exiles, but most people blame his future tyranny on a brain fever that befell him later on. He blew money on lavish projects, some still helpful like aqueducts, to building a two mile long floating bridge across the Bay of Bali so he could ride his horse across it day after day. He even ordered his men to attack the sea by collecting shells with their helmets. His lascivious love affairs included copulating with the wives of his allies and even allegedly his own sisters. Caligula's reign was equal parts terrifying and embarrassing, which is probably why his officers stabbed him to death. Number eight, Leopold II of Belgium. During the height of colonialism, Leopold of Belgium wanted to make his mark by conquering the African Congo. As soon as I said colonialism, you know, you know where things are going, so get ready. He made it his property and instead of, you know, being a good human being, he decided to establish a dictatorship instead. He made the rest of Europe think that he was acting as a good guy, so they'd give him money, then proceeded to hire mercenaries. These mercenaries were set with the task of draining as much money from the state by enforcing free labor camps. Anyone who disobeyed or failed to meet demands were severely punished and even had their limbs removed. Leopold was responsible for the deaths of 20% of the population and thankfully was stopped before he could do more damage. Roger Casement, after doing a little digging, released a report which detailed the horrors he had committed under the guise of philanthropy. He was forced to surrender the Congo, though it was considered a part of Belgium until the 1950s. <sighs> Whew, buckle up folks, it only gets worse from here. It's number seven, and we're already at Genghis Khan. Get ready. Genghis Khan, ruler of the Mongolian Empire, killed so many people. He changed the carbon footprint of the earth. In one single battle, he killed over 1.2 million people. Though this sounds like an exaggeration, I don't find it hard to believe, since he just 
left the corpses to rot, the battlefields became oily and whole mounds of like mountains of bodies formed. Genghis Khan was supposedly responsible for over 40 million deaths. If you need a number to compare that to, that's the same amount of people who died in World War One altogether. He also enjoyed in excess the spoils of war, brutalizing women and assaulting them. In addition to that, he held mass beauty contests and all those who didn't win would be given to his soldiers like objects. Mm. Because of that, around 16 million people are said to be descendants of him today. That's how many people he... Yeah. Many people blame his brutal and ruthless upbringing as Khan very much had to raise himself under the mentality to kill or be killed. He even killed his own brother at age 10 just for not sharing food. He was also horrendous when it came to tormenting his betrayers. Some ways include pouring molten silver down their throats and sawing people in half while they were still alive. Oh, and he killed 75% of the population of Iran and tried to commit an entire genocide. Yeah, the list goes on, but so does this list and there is more to come, so... Let's go. Number six, Talat Pasha. Pasha was the Grand Vizier to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century and was the main architect of the Armenian Genocide. When Armenian families were evicted from their homes in 1915, his signature was on the orders. On April 24th, they executed several hundred intellectuals in order to begin Turkifying the country. Many were sent through the Mesopotamian desert on death marches without food or water after being stripped naked so the sun would just boil them alive. Anyone who stopped walking was shot. He also created a special organization made of killers and ex-convicts who were ordered to carry out the liquidation of the Christian elements. They drowned people in rivers, threw civilians off cliffs, even crucified and burned people alive. Yep, this happened in the 1900s, by the way. So there are about 600,000 to 1.5 million reasons we wish this man never existed because that is how many people Pasha was responsible for killing. Ooh, man. Number five, Idi Amin. General Idi Amin staged a coup on January 25th, 1971 and forced Uganda's first prime minister, Milton Obo, into exile. From there, he created a reign of terror that abused Uganda's freedom after more than 70 years of British rule. Amin organized mass executions of Akoli and Lango Christian tribes who were loyal to Obo. He terrorized his own country with internal security forces whose main purpose was to eliminate those who opposed him. His brutality also resulted in the collapse of the economy, this man just seemed like he just didn't have a single good bone in his body. He was also rumored to have eaten human flesh and his vicious and inhumane rule resulted in the death of 300,000 civilians. Eventually Amin was forced to flee and sought refuge in Saudi Arabia, though he was never punished for his crimes and died in 2003 due to organ failure. So he got away with it, essentially. Number 4, Pol Pot. Hmm. You'd think a leader's job would be to protect and serve their country with love and respect, but I guess Pol Pot didn't see it that way. Originally named Salah Sar, Pot was the leader of the Khmer Rouge totalitarian regime during 1975 to 79 in Cambodia, though technically longer. It was a radical communist government who caused the death of more than 2 million people through forced labor, starvation, disease, torment, persecution, and execution. He wanted to purify society and wanted to extinguish capitalism, western culture, city life, religion, and all foreign influences in order to form a pure communist regime. All media outlets along with embassies and external medical help were refused and essentially he barricaded Cambodia into their own little world. Education was halted, healthcare eliminated, it was crazy. The people were forced into slave labor on the killing fields, only allowed 180 grams of rice a day. Deadly purges were conducted to eliminate remnants of the old society, including monks, police, doctors, lawyers, teachers, ex-soldiers, along with their families, and former government officials. His cruelty and madness knew no bounds. It took years for him to finally be put under house arrest by his peers and was never truly punished for his crimes against humanity. He died of a heart attack in 1998 following his arrest. So, yeah. And we're reaching our top three. <laughs> I bet you thought, I bet you thought number three was gonna be number one. Nope, there were worse people than him, believe it or not. Number three, we have Adolf. I can't say his last name because apparently YouTube won't let me, which is ridiculous. So he's not Voldemort, but you know who I'm talking about, that really evil German guy. Yeah, 
I don't really need to go into detail here unless you don't know about one of the most infamous genocides to take place in all of history. Along with the amount of people Adolf's army killed in World War II, his warped and disgusting worldview resulted in the destruction of more than 6 million lives, mainly those of Jewish descent but LGBTQ, political prisoners, and basically anyone he and his followers deemed a lesser human. He was the personification of hatred and led the world into one of the most deadly wars to date. We should also give a shout out to all of his henchmen who served underneath him, all working together to enact one of the cruelest moments in history. If he hadn't been born, who knows if it would have happened anyways due to political and social tensions at the time, but maybe, just maybe, it wouldn't have happened at all and all those lives would still be around today. Number two, guys, like I knew he was bad, but dug deep today, dug deep today, and I did not, I would never, never thought I would say this, but number two, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin made his own henchman disappear in photos, and boy do we wish it was him instead. Stalin was the premier of the Soviet Union and was responsible for the deaths of more than 20 million, 20 million of his own people, double that if you count World War II. He ruled for 30 years and ruled with an iron fist, eliminating anyone who opposed him, and as you can guess, there were many. In 1927 to 1929, he had one million people exiled or imprisoned, 9 to 11 million were forced off their lands, and 3 million peasants were arrested or exiled in the mass collectivization program. 6 to 7 million were killed by artificial famine in the 1930s. During 1936 to 1938, he executed approximately 750,000 during the Great Terror, a brutal political campaign to remove dissenters and any others he considered a threat. He was so paranoid. This guy had no regard for human life whatsoever. While the world was focused on Adolf, he he was doing all of this, and he was fighting on the Allies' side. Though we started supporting Hitler, and then he came onto our side. Anyways, mm. it is estimated that Stalin orchestrated the deaths of 60 million people, which means about 40,000 people died every week during his raid. Need I say more? And if you think that's bad, number one spot, Mao Zedong. Ready? I don't think anyone can be. Mao Zedong during 1966 to 1976 turned China into a house of fear by eradicating 65 million people. In his attempt for a socialist China, he killed anyone that got in his way, kind of like Stalin, through execution and mass starvation. His biggest threat was the intellect. And revered Emperor Shi Huang, who buried 460 scholars and sought to surpass him by burying alive 46,000 scholars. Yeah, my stomach turned when I read that. That's awful. He coined his operation the Great Leap Forward. To combat rising resistance, he created the Red Army, composed of girls and boys from the ages of 14 to 21, to roam cities and target enemies of the state, especially their teachers. He would make the teachers wear dunce hats, cover their faces with ink, and make them crawl on all fours and bark like dogs. He also expanded a system of a thousand forced labor camps. Most amazing fam, I could go on, but I honestly don't have room. It just seems like there's no end to all the awful things that he did. For all these reasons and more, Mao is of course in our number one spot. Coming in at number 7, we have Vlad the Impaler. Vlad the Impaler was the inspiration behind the legend of Dracula, and like his fictitious counterpart, he was a very bloodthirsty chap. Vlad was alive for a mere 45 years between 1431 and 1476, but in that time it is estimated that he could have killed around 1,000 people. Vlad was Prince of Wallachia, a historic region of Romania, and to cut a really long story short, he killed everybody body that stood in his way of power or threatened his position. He plundered villages and killed armies. How did he kill them? Well, he's not called Vlad the Impaler by accident. He really liked to impale his victims and then proudly display their corpses. He also impaled animals and nailed turbans to the heads of Turkish messengers. He was known to be cruel and wicked within his lifetime, with news of his evil soul becoming a popular story in German courts. Coming in at number 4, we have Delphine. Lalori. Considered one of the most evil women in the world, let alone New Orleans, this absolute historic she devil even got her own character on American Horror Story. Delphine grew up as a young, rich beauty in a wealthy white Creole family in New Orleans. After three marriages, she brought her own home and installed a slave's quarter in the top floor. Beneath the shiny veneer of her lavishly furnished home, Delphine had a sick, 
secret. The slaves quarters were actually a secret torture and murder room. She woefully mistreated her staff but the extent of the horror wasn't known until a fire broke out in her home. The fire marshal searched the top floor only to find a dozen people chained up with others in cages. Body parts and severed heads sat in buckets and organs were strewn across the floor. Delphine never faced justice as she fled to Paris. A recent evil up next at number 3 we have Harold Shipman. Harold Shipman was a British doctor who broke the Hippocratic Oath and abused his power to carry out 218 or more sick murders. Shipman killed people by administering them with a lethal dose of diamorphine and then he used his position as a doctor to sign their death certificates and also to doctor their medical records to suggest that they were in bad health. 80% of his victims were women, usually over the age of 50. However, Shipman has been linked to the death of a four year old. His last victim was pensioner Kathleen Grundy, for whom he had forged a will, leaving himself in excess of £300,000. Eventually, he was discovered and sent to prison in 2000, and in 2004, he hung himself on his 58th birthday, reportedly waiting this long specifically so his wife would get his £100,000 pension. Sick.